The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. Additional support provided by Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or a great location for an event. ExploreAlex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Welcome to Postcards, our weekly look at the art, history, and cultural heritage of Western Minnesota and beyond. I'm Eric Olson. For thousands of years, Native American Plains and Woodland Indian tribes traveled great distances to the sacred pipestone quarries, where stone used to fashion ceremonial pipes was found. At the Pipestone National Monument, Native Americans still quarry the red pipestone and visitors are invited to see how it's done. I was born and raised here in Pipestone, Minnesota, my whole life, basically. And I am enrolled with the Sisseton, Wapleton, Dakota Nation as a quarter blood, one fourth. The best thing that I like about coming down here to Quarry, if you can picture it, this is my buddy. This is, this is someone who listens to my problems. This is someone who You've had a hard day, you know, you come down here and you sit on the quartzite, you know, in a spiritual way, quartzite rock, no matter where you find it, is grounding, is grounding energy. So I'll sit here and I'll lay down some tobacco and then um, I'll sit on the quartzite and just, you can call it meditation, call it whatever you will, but I just tuning in to, to my elements around me. And it's a very, very powerful place that, that you can feel the energy and feel um, like freedom. The National Monument was created to preserve the quarries that they quarry the stone for pipestone. And they use the stone mainly for peace pipes as well as religious ceremonies. Native Americans were granted the right to always access the quarries. And so if they are a member of a federally recognized tribe, they are allowed to come and quarry pipestone. When they found pipestone rock, it's, it's basically is a compressed clay. It's soft, it's the color of red, the color of blood, the essence of what keeps your body alive. Most of what you're going to see in a rubble pile, especially the purpley, hazy color, is the quartzite. We have a vein that we're working with that's 14 to 16 inches thick. And you're taking off your top layer, and then after we take the, the undesirable layer off, then we get to the bottom layer, which in my opinion is the prize. The bottom layer is the prize. It's a pliable material. You can smoke the pipe with many people, and the pipe bowl can get hot but you set it down off to the side and it cools down fairly quickly and there's no fractures, there's no warpage, there's nothing. The pipe is just as strong as it was the day it came out of the quarries. Part of the problem that we have around this time of the season is, is our rainy season is coming in. And it depends if you've got a dry season, wet season. We are going to have uh, water in our quarries, but eventually it does drain off. When we were younger, <laughs> our uncles said, you kids aren't going uptown to cause trouble. You're coming out to work with us. You know, so we did, about 11 years old. We took a lot of the smaller rocks and pitched them up higher. But when they knew they were going to pull stone, they said, all right, you guys, come here. And they, each and every one of us went down there, and we took our turns at using the 10-pound hammer and just you know, practice hitting that wedge. You know, They were helping us and showing us how to. We have 56 active quarry sites here at the monument and we have a wait list of approximately 140 people right now. Historically this was neutral territory. Enemy tribes could come on here and quarry stone together as brothers. We've had 23 other tribes that had association 
or ownership of this land. You could be enemies and leave your weapons up on the hill, come down here, and you can quarry your stone, but you leave as enemies. You know, so it, it, has, it has its uniqueness here. I was basically born and raised into pipe carving. I watched uh, a lot of my family members do, do this. My grandfather, my uncles, my aunts, small craft carvers. But it was my mother who was instrumental in teaching me how to carve a pipe. She showed me you know, the basics. And I've been doing it for 31 years now. This is going to be an eagle's head right here. And his wings are going to come up right, right, right in here. A lot of people come here and they're curious as to what pipes are, what they're used for, the styles, design. But the other part that I deal with is a lot of people are actually searching for a journey and they're drawn to the pipes and the ceremonies and stuff, you know. So they come and they'll talk it over with one of us pipe makers and they'll say, well, can you carve whatever it might be? And we sit there and we'll talk and, I, and as we're talking, I'm, I'm visualizing this pipe in my mind, you know, and if I can see it clearly, the person's actually ready. If I have a hard time seeing it, are you sure you're ready for this? You know, I have to ask these questions before I, I'll take the job. I do all my own coring. Yeah. You know, I pull all my stone out that I, that I have here out of my own quarry that I got. And I've been in the same quarry for about 28 years. The rule is, you cannot stack your rocks wider than your quarry. I had no choice but to go up. You know, I'm actually proud of how high this quarry is because a lot of people will say, you know, we were way over there. We could see your rubble pile from way over there. You know, that, 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 that's kind of a nice thing. But it does tell you something. It speaks itself, how much work went into this. 95% of the time that I've been in this quarry, I've worked by myself. Now I'm looking where the pipestone rock is. Now pipestone rock will be broken up into what we call as seams. But what we're looking for is the fracture lines. Those are separate seams. So basically what you're doing is you're reading a book backwards. That's the best way I could describe it. So once I figured out where I want to go, where the weakest spot is at, then I come up here and then I will start the process with the sledgehammers and wedges and start breaking everything out. And now I read the book forward to go to get down to the pipestone rock. We have questions about spirit, about creation, about why we are here. And it's amazing sometimes what you can actually feel down here. You start thinking about the past, you know, how they did it. And the next thing you know, I hear, I hear a voice. And it will come from this side or way over, but it sounds far away, but yet it still sounds close. Curious as I am, I'll come up and I'll stick my head out of the hole like a gopher, and I'm looking. I'm looking and I'm listening but I took myself out of being in tune with my elements and now the voices are gone. So a lot of times I will just listen, you know, just sit there. If I hear voices, I stop and I'll listen and I'll relax and I'll give them their chance. I don't, I don't know the language, you know, because it's nothing that I'm familiar with, you know, so it has to be something further along than when my people were here last. My grandmother always told my uncles, and I've always remembered this, you guys go down there with a good heart because your stone will come out the same way your heart is. You know, so I've always, always remembered that. You know, come down here with a good heart. My coring season starts when the frost comes out of the ground. My coring season stops when the first major snowfall hits us. Before the coring season gets started, I actually will climb into a lodge, a sweat lodge myself, and just sit there with myself in the sweat lodge with the hot rocks and then do a sweat lodge and you know and I'm I'm honoring spirit for for the great gift that he has given to us I'm honoring mother earth for the for the labor that I'm going to go through to get into her flesh to take the stone out for her taking care of the pipestone rock it's just respect all I'm doing is respecting the earth mother and honoring her and honoring creator of of what we can do today you know, our possibilities are unlimited, and I choose to be unlimited in this quarry. I feel like I'm keeping a lot of part of the culture alive, and I love what I do. I love to carve. I love to create with my hands. When you start realizing that a block of stone can show you what it wants to be, you're tuning into something very special right there. You know, so that, that's what keeps me going, you know. And, but I get to create, and I get to carve people's dreams and visions so they may continue this journey that they choose to be on. Another use of the land in our region involves farmers and what is called threshing. 
the process of loosening the edible part of grain from the rest of the plant. For farmers today, it is a much more automated process, but time was when a threshing machine represented the latest and greatest technology. And that harvest history is still celebrated today. Well, you're five miles south of Jackson on Highway 71, and we're having our annual threshing bee today. That's, this is the seventh year. We've got a nice crowd. The weather's been cooperative, and we've got a lot of things going on. We're thrashing, we got uh, music, we got petting zoo, we got a nice meal being prepared. Well, one neighbor bought a thrash machine that, that reminded him of his dad's, but he didn't have any small grain or any place to try it out the next year. So we got together in the neighborhood. One neighbor put in some some oats, and uh, he had the thrash machine, and they said, now oh, where should we have, the, have it? And I had this location here, and I was glad to let him bring it over. And just a few neighbors came the first year to see how things went, and we didn't have any of this extra stuff the first year, I don't think. But it, it just kept growing from then. We've had uh, excellent weather every year. It's a case trash machine, a 22 inch is my tr trash machine. And then, I don't know, we just got together and start cutting oats and thrashing. And this has been seven years now I've been doing this. So years ago when I was like 14 or 15, our folks used to thrash oats. And then I just kept it kind of going, I guess. You know, it, it quit for a while there. I guess I'm about the only one down this area that has a thrash machine. But Butterfield's got a thrash machine and stuff. But they're a lot bigger than us, you know. We're just a little popcorn outfit here. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, just for the old timers to see again, you know. A lot of these older people are going to be gone pretty quick, and nobody's going to take over these. Well, they was used way back in the 30s and the 40s, you know, and then in the 50s, and then they quit for a while, and then it was kind of gone for a while, and then everybody kind of got back into it for a little bit. So I think it's a good thing to show the people that, you know, we can still thrash oats the way it used to be years ago, you know. The modern farmer, they want to set an air conditioning unit. This here is the old time way. It takes a lot of time, a lot of people. I'm glad a lot of friends and buddies came out to help shock oats and load oats and get everything going. If it wasn't for them, I couldn't do it by myself. I'm just thankful everybody pitches in and has help out a little bit, you know. That's a good thing. This is only one horse. Who makes it? Uh, Fairbanks and Morris makes it. This was just used for any of the chores around the farm, grinding feed for the chickens or washing clothes or anything that needed belt pulley to run different PC equipment. Everything was mechanical back then, no electricity. This one's a 50 horse superior, ran uh, oil well. Well, this was my dad's hobby and we've always come along with him. Something to do, we go to a bunch of different shows and a lot of auctions, and there was thousands of manufacturers. Everybody had a different design. Oh, they're a lot of fun because pretty soon nobody's going to know how any of this happened or nobody realizes what everybody did in the 20s to make a living and, and to work and everything. So, I mean, it's a lot of fun. The guy could adjust the speed from, from the rope. I never did it when I was a kid growing up. We had a combine by that time. 1940 Fairbanks, Morris, horse and a half gas engine, uh, running on gasoline, and it's running uh, just an old well pump, pumping water. This is how they'd set it up to pump water for the livestock, or some people uh, had, a, they had a small one in the house that was hand operated for pumping the water for the sink. Same principle. Most of them, if they're in running condition, they're easy to operate, and uh, the smaller ones, they're easy to move around, you know, rather than a large one, and you can take them to different shows and build them up to this or a grinder or whatever. People can see how things were done back in that era. Generation now doesn't realize what it was back then. You know, they walk up and turn the faucet on, they've got water, or go to the store to get their food and that. And back in the old days, they grind their own feed for flour and pump water and all that. So this gives them a glimpse into the past. I'm 
86. I played since I was 14 years old. I learn everything by ear. If I hear a song, I can play it. I've been here all seven years. Yeah, they know a good thing when they see it. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give them some entertainment here, otherwise they wouldn't have too much. I pitched a lot of bundles in my day, I tell you. No, not on that machine. We had a big 42 inch machine and there was a crew of about 10, 12 people there. 100 degree temperature, we'd be out there pitching them bundles. And then when we got through with the job, the guy would go in and get a pony of beer out there and then we had a little celebration. We lost three fellows this last year. We're going to have a little tractor parade, and we're going to remember those three guys. Again, we want to welcome everybody to our 7th Annual Threshing Bee. We'll be starting with our parade here in just a few moments. Each person say just a few words about the tractor. They know more about it than I do. Uh, 1930 John Deere GP come from the Harry Thurmer estate sale on 1999. It's a 1960 Oliver 880. Okay, the Massey is my tractor that we used, a pace tractor yesterday. George Sabota is driving it for me. This was my father-in-law's tractor. These three grain drills behind here would find it awry between the tall corn. Winter came in as a ground cover for the winter, as a little fodder for the cattle. My tractor is a 1931 John Deere D. Well, I think it's great to remind people that, you know, Agriculture has come a long ways in, in 40, 50 years. We can remember back when this was the norm, and it's a big change. <laughs> it's just part of the history of this county and this state. We need to appreciate it and, and to uh, just honor it. Well, just to see how we used to do it, I guess. And we thought maybe it would wane with losing a lot of older people, but the younger ones seem to be taking interest, too. Well, uh, maybe I'm giving away my age, but I can remember when we did, did all this for keeps, I mean, now it's just for fun. When they really did it, well, usually it would be uh, seven, eight farmers would do it in a group, and one farmer would probably own the thrash machine, the other might own the, the tractor engine, and uh, they'd, then the rest of them would uh, cut their oats and shock it, and, and then they'd go from farm to farm. Most generally, they wouldn't get the one farmer's done in a day. Most generally, it was a two-day affair for each, and of course, but most older people will remember a lot about the threshing was the noon meals that had to be pre prepared with, uh, I can remember my mother getting them. And uh, it, uh, it was particular about uh, what they had the day before. So if they were coming to the next place the next day, so they would have something different for dinner. I mean, it, I can remember my mother, when I'd come home from uh, threshing at one of the neighbors, she'd wonder, what did you have for dinner today? because they're going to be here tomorrow, so we've got to have something different. Yeah. Fried chicken and homemade pies, and but I'm 82, and not very many people, those, that group is waning real fast. <laughs> we shift to present day now and a high-tech talent contest at the University of Minnesota Morris, which combines creativity with a non-English language, namely Chinese. Yeah, last year I got an email from the publishing company, Chunan Sui Company. They are inviting all the um, Chinese teachers and students who are using their textbook to participate in their um, contest. I don't know why they inform us really late this year and we have a very short time to prepare because the deadline is earlier than last year. So that means we have probably half the time we, we, we did last year. I had the song in my mind um, because I knew I had a bigger class this year than last year and I thought if we're going to do the song again, the, con the contest again, I'm going to do a group song. Last year the, the song was just a uh, very simple um, very simple love song, but this year I want to have a typical group song. So I, and this song is a very classic one. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we did have suggestions, though. Yeah. You know, there were like uh, suggestions going on, and then, you know, man uh, decided the song for us through suggestions. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody in the class really knew a whole lot of Chinese songs, so we kind of trusted her to uh, make the final decision. It has been created for 25 years. Um, was originally from Taiwan, and now uh, I grew up listening to this song. I know the song very well, so, and, and I know it has a very good meaning. It's praying for world peace. It's pretty much about how we want tomorrow to be better, like um, people putting in all their effort to make the world a better place. To so take care of the world and, you know, um, your actions, make sure that your actions will lead to a better tomorrow. <laughs> At first, in the beginning of the class, my teacher talked about the contest, and she wanted all of us to do a group um, con group video together. Um, but for me, I thought it might take so much take too much time, so I decided to do it myself. I didn't give her any help. I didn't know what song he was she, she was going to choose, and I didn't know um, how she was going to make the video. She did it all by herself. <laughs> It probably took me a little over two weeks to do it. Um, for about two weeks, I had to practice the song, learning the lyrics, and trying to improve my enunciation. Um, I also tried to fam familiarize myself with the emotions of the song so I can express it when I sing and not be smiling if it's a sad song. And after she finished that, she told me, Miss Kel, go to this web link and you, you see my video there. And then I click on it and I was so surprised. I was really surprised because um, she did it really fast. Probably she finished the whole thing in one week time. It was way ahead of our group song and all by herself. That was amazing. Um, I'm Hmong, so I speak Hmong, but because I'm so used to my language that I have to kind of change things around and pronounce it differently. Um, so that was hard for me. I actually spent a lot of time going online and trying to look up how do you pronounce this and that. <laughs> My understanding of the song is they use this metaphor about two butterflies flying in the sky and one is ahead and the other one is behind and the other one falls and they can't catch that butterfly. But to me, um, it to me, I understood it as if um, this person has a secret that they can't tell the other person, and so they want to um, not be in a relationship or not um, be with them, so they walk away. I kind of did it for fun and for extra credit <laughs> in class. Um, but because there are so many people who submitted their videos, I didn't know if I was going to win. And so <laughs> it was a big surprise for me. Well, I didn't find out myself. Um, my husband told me. Um, he called me one day, and then he, um, on Monday, on November 15th, I just finished my class. And he told me, you know what? You got two prizes you know, in your class. Dia got first one in her, in her solo um, category, and you got second place in the group category. And I was, what? Really? Are you kidding me? I think it was definitely our heart. I don't know. I mean, like, if you watch the music video, you can tell that we're actually having, like, we're having fun. Like, that was our main goal, was to just enjoy ourselves, like, through the process. I mean, of course, we thought about, like, oh, that'd be so cool if we won. But it was, it was fun. It wasn't, it didn't feel like an assignment. Yeah, it, like, it was fun and educational at the same time. That's what I really like about the, um music video and along with that you know because we had so much fun doing it you know even though other people you know when while watching the video it might not look that good you know to yeah, us we, were, we had we a lot of hopes for it. so i just thought we were just so blessed huh? you know but i couldn't believe in the beginning but then i thought yeah, actually, we did a good job, and why shouldn't we get to prizes? You know, we should get it. Oh, she's been the leader behind yeah. everything. Like, just listen to the song, you know. Yeah, just she's listen like, to the song. This is she's your homework. Us. Go listen to the song. Just listen to the song. I'm 
very proud of them. We have done a lot of um, studying, practice, and training in class, and I, I think that that's, you know, that's worth the time. So, yeah, I'm just so happy. For me, the best thing about doing this uh, project was learning a new language and seeing it. Um, because I, I don't know any other language besides Hmong, English, maybe a little bit sign language, but um, it was a good learning experience for me. Yeah, I, I love Chinese too, because you know, for me it's an elective. Uh, I already took a proficiency test, so I don't even have to take Chinese. But then it was more like, you know, there's a lot of Chinese students in Morris, and it would be good to, you know, learn about this class. And once I got in this class, it was really enjoyable, especially the uh, movie, the music video. It has been really helpful. Yeah. There are a lot of Chinese international students here on campus. So just knowing like the very basics of Chinese, kind of, it really helps yeah. with like communication. If they're, continue to, they're going to continue to um, hold it, we're going to do that next year. As long as I'm staying here, yeah, I will do that. It's so much fun. And I think that's a good way to, um, to make students excited, make them really interested in a class. And then after doing the project, we are feeling like we are much closer to each other. We are like a family. For more information about any of the stories you've seen here on Postcards, visit our website, www.pioneer.org postcards. And check us out on Facebook. Click the like button. We love to be liked. That's it for now. We'll see you again real soon here on Postcards. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. Additional support provided by Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or a great location for an event. ExploreAlex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave.